Hey there, Rick, how are you? Excellent, how could I not be great with two bowls and love around me? I know, because we, as we promised, we were starting in two shakes of a bowl's tail. That's right, that's right. <laughs> So welcome to everybody. My name is Anne Merchant and I work for the National Academy of Sciences. And as always, and what would I do if I were not joined by... I'm Rick Lovard. I'm the Program Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Exactly. And we are very happy today to be joined by three amazing women who are going to, as build, talk to us about the science of attraction, but of course, seen through the lens of the animal world, because we thought that that would be especially fitting during Valentine's Day. I was look, I got um, an Instagram post from a friend who, um, it was a funny video from um, um, a British, uh, two British comedians that were talking about how tired, how much we love our Valentines, but we might be a little tired of spending as much time as we have been with them over the last year. So we thought, well, let's let's talk about our animal friends. Um, so we'll be doing that. But of course, we need to open as we always do by talking a little bit about the National Academy of Sciences and about the Science and Entertainment Exchange because we got to earn our keep here. And um, and so of course, the National Academy of Sciences is a private nonprofit institution in Washington, D.C. And I always feel that I have to say that because I do have colleagues who will occasionally say to me, you know, but so you work for the federal government. And I always have to remind them, no, that whole private nonprofit thing means that we are not part of the federal government. In fact, the whole idea that Abraham Lincoln had at the time in 1863 was that the National Academy of Sciences sat outside the framework of government to be able to help um, um, our friends at the federal government steer a good course towards science policy that was informed by experts who were who were um, essentially made themselves available to the institution, sitting on our committees as they have done. We have 6,000, I think, volunteers almost every year that help do the work of the institution. Um, and we've been especially busy over the last year. We're now set to be even busier with a, a, an administration that is very focused on science in a variety of ways. Um, but I And I, every week I've talked about the different kinds of reports that we've been working on. But I wanted to, to also mention that we do have things like the Science and Entertainment Exchange, ways that we present our, our work, not just through the big fat 400 page reports that we do. So there are other projects. And so for example, there's something called the science behind it, which looks at, um, we took, I think we started off by looking at about 20, 25 key questions that were identified through some survey work that we had done about what kinds of things people are interested in. And then we looked at the corpus of work that we had at the institution and put together answers to those questions. Sort of very short, very easy answers. There are some videos associated with that. So can science prove or disprove the existence of God? Are genetically modified foods safe to eat? Um, what would it take to get humans to Mars? So there's a, just a variety of things out there. How how reliable is forensic evidence? So sort of like, you know, pick your topic, see what's interesting. Um, and I think Sachi put a link in the chat. And so you can go check that out. So you don't have to read 400 page reports to access the work of the institution. Um, and it's exactly why the Science and Entertainment Exchange was created as well, that we don't expect everybody to access our work through those big reports. And so, of course, that's a good segue to you, Rick, so that you can talk about the work of the exchange. Yeah, effectively what the program is, is if you're a writer, producer, studio executive, storyteller in any big mainstream format, if you have a question about science, you can call 844-NEED-SCI and I or Sachi will answer the phone and we will connect you to someone who can answer your question and put it in context. And so we've done over 3,300 consults since we opened our doors and also about 300 events that are designed to sort of tell you what we think is interesting in science effectively. And we've worked on movies like Avengers Infinity War, Man of Steel, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Songbird. We do a lot of work on documentaries, Scott Kennedy. Um, and if you're a STEM professional and you're just tuning in and you're interested in you know, sharing your wisdom, sharing what you know with storytellers, uh, we want to hear from you. So please also don't hesitate to call 844-NEED-SAI or uh, email me, rlovard at nas.edu or sachi at sgerbin at nas.edu. Um, got a couple things to do, points of order, before we dive right into the event. 
Um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank our tech support in DC, Alex Velasquez, for uh, uh, jumping in this week. I mean, Jay couldn't do it. Um, and uh, Alex is fantastic. We've done a bunch of events with him over the years, and he does a great job. Also, the whole office in DC, Courtney Sloan and Jeff Fishman, as well as Sachi in Los Angeles. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who keep these lights on, these specific lights that you are watching right now on your computer screen. Um, also, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Walt Disney Company, Film Me, Google, the Lida Hill Foundation, Corteva, and individual donors. For all of you who gave for this event, especially for those who gave at the supporter level, thank you so much. We put that money right back into these events. Uh, so if you're enjoying these events and you want to support them, you can do that when you are SVP, and we thank you for doing it. Our 2021 challenge coins, for those who gave at the supporter level, are on the way. Uh, I'm supposed to be getting them in a week or two, and then we're going to turn them around and get them out to you as soon as possible. Uh, last point of order about uh, today's event structure. Um, if you're on an iPad, apparently it's up. If you're on a computer, apparently it's down. down. There's a thing that says Q&A. If you have a question during any of the talks, I'm going to be monitoring those. And today I'm actually also going to be Moderate, moderating a bit, uh, but I'm going to be your voice. I'm going to be the voice of the audience. So please ask your questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And uh, and thank you for asking. We always get such great questions. You guys are fantastic. Uh, let's see. I think that's it for me for this week. So back to you, Anne. Well, I think it's now time for our rabbit hole. And so I have been, I I love wallpaper. I've always loved wallpaper. And I discovered on the Victoria and Albert Museum website that they have a brief history of wallpaper, which is really interesting. Apparently, it's considered to be the, um, the poor relation to the decorative arts, although I would tend to disagree with that. Um, and Or maybe it's just because I can't afford um, truly expensive decorative arts on my wall. So maybe it is true. Um, but... Uh, uh, they also have a apparently a really wonderful and one of the world's best collections of wallpapers that they've been curating since the mid 1800s. And wallpaper, it turns out, goes back to the 1500s. Um, so I'm considering some new wallpaper for my uh, small um, vanity bathroom. And I don't think there's any place you can go a little crazier than than you know, small bathrooms. So this one is called Chimerical. So I especially like this one, which I think is really great. Um, and then this one, which you probably can't tell, like it's got a great silvery sheen, but I really like this one as well. So I'm tending towards the chimerical just because, I mean, come on, a giraffe and a, like, it's just so great. But anyway. Um, I'm both chimerical too. Like I'm, I'm totally into wallpaper and all right, so for, my little, for my little thing this week, I just, I want to uh, say in the spirit of Valentine's Day, my wife gave me this fantastic book that I cannot hold up because my green screen likes to take it away from me when I put it up to try to show you. This book is called, is by uh, a published by a company called Tashin. And it is, it's basically all about the different like noble class in the 15 and 1600s used to compete for the weirder curios that they had in their curio cabinets and curio rooms. And so it's, it's this fantastic high resolution photos of uh, curios, which I just really have enjoyed this book. I will say the book is giant and weighs about 5,000 pounds. So it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it, is, it is the whole coffee table book. Well, you just need a bigger coffee table, clearly. That's yeah. the deal. <laughs> Well, and I think our rabbit holes actually worked really well together. So, so yeah. good on us. <laughs> yeah, nice um, so, of course, the, the thing that we we are most excited about doing is, of course, introducing the, the three women who we were, we felt like we scored when we got all of them to say, yes, you know, we are mindful of the fact that even though when we reach out to scientists, it's not like they're busy jumping on airplanes and going to lots of meetings or that they are um, rushing from, from one thing to another in the physical world, but they're all really still busy. 
Um, so it's not like they're sitting around uh, drumming their fingers, waiting for an invitation to land in their inbox. And yet somehow we managed to get all three of these people to say yes. Now, of course, Zoe Donaldson has been on our live stage a couple of times in the past. So we started with Zoe and we got her to say yes. So we felt like, okay, that's a good start. And then we reached out to Hope Klug and to Jennifer Vertolin, two scientists whom we had not known in real life before, but whose work we were familiar with. And we got them both to say yes. And, and the great thing is that they, the three of them did not actually know one another. So we also felt like that was really a nice opportunity to introduce them to one another. So we are excited to have them for today's event. And the other thing I would just say, and I think Jennifer actually said this in our prep call, this is really awesome. Three amazing women on the same panel. And, and I don't know that we did that with great intentionality, although we've wanted three amazing people, but three amazing women. Okay, that's that's the trifecta. So, so we want to invite all of them um, to join us now and to give the rest of the time to them because that's why we are all here. So take it away, amazing women. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me and letting me be part of this wonderful event. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm Jennifer Verlin, um, and I'm going to sort of kick things off a little bit with uh, some tips and lessons that we take from the other animal kingdom on how we find a mate. And just to give you a little bit of background about how I came to this, I'm an animal behaviorist and I study uh, mating systems and social systems, primarily of uh, prairie dogs has been one of my systems. But I really got interested in thinking about uh, what we can learn from other animals to improve our lives uh, by a a couple of things. One, some of the common problems that we have in human relationships, they, they may also happen in other animal relationships, but I noticed that they didn't have all of the same problems. And then ultimately, my own sort of tragic dating life led me to this bright idea of approaching, uh, picking a mate or dating, as we would call it, from a, from a scientific perspective. And my rationale was really simple. Um, I didn't see with all the animals that I watched and all of the, the things that I knew, I didn't see some of the same problems. So for example, I never saw female prairie dogs running around confused about whether or not they could get a date. Um, I didn't see male harlequin ducks pursue a female duck only to lose interest after he's caught her. Um, and the biggest surprise maybe was, and not really, but was that you didn't really see domestic violence um, and aggression in faithful and monogamous species. And, and, and so those animal couples that also form those types of, of relationships, monogamous and, and faithful, uh, they have longevity. And you're going to hear a, a, a little later about what is the glue that holds these uh, relationships together. But I want to zero in on how do we find that mate and what are some of the biological things that are going on uh, that are important when we pick a mate. Uh, now, I could have stuck with just reading the literature and, and watching animals, but I'm a field biologist, so I also chose to kind of test my ideas out in the field, the dating field, um, because I love data and science is fun, right? So, um, so I did a lot of reading, but then I went on a lot of dates. I had a lot of coffee. Um, I had uh, a few happy hours and, of course, the coveted dinner. Uh, so I learned a lot. Uh, not all the dates were good, uh, but they were all very informative. And so I'm going to share three big takeaways about what other animals do and how they strategize to pick a good mate. So <laughs> I think we can all agree that something has gone terribly wrong for this male peacock. And, and if he showed up like this instead of like this... Uh, females would basically dismiss this male immediately. Now, we know that in humans, within one-tenth of a second, 
uh, of looking at someone, we have made some decisions. The decisions we've made include not only how attractive an individual is, but also how friendly they are, how competent they are, and how trustworthy they are. Now, if you think about this, this is faster than it takes to wink at someone, or at least faster than I can wink at someone. And at the same time, we have this sort of cultural narrative that says we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. You know, all that glitters isn't gold. Um, but when we look at other animals, we know that appearance matters a lot. And, and whether we like to admit it or not, this is obviously true for us because we make all of these decisions that quickly upon looking at someone. And so the question isn't really to me, is this good or bad? The more interesting question is why? Is there a biological reason uh, for, uh, for appearance to matter so much? Now for peahens, it goes simply beyond uh, whether or not a male is flashy. In fact, uh, they're, they're really, really choosy. And so you can see from the title that being choosy is a winning strategy. Now, female peahens are so picky that they only um, really mate with males that have over 150 spots. Now, when you look at this, it's a bit dizzying and you might wonder, well, are peahens just running around counting males with spots or counting spots? And the answer is no. It turns out that males with over 150 spots are very symmetrical. And we know that symmetry matters in humans too. And it's not just all about appearance. Uh, if you're gonna form a longer term relationship, it's gotta be personality and compatibility. And the same is true for other animals. The key takeaway though, is that being picky is incredibly important. So if you're somebody whose friends or family says, oh, you're just too picky, you've got science and a slew of other animals behind you saying, no, 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 be very, very choosy. The next thing that I wanna kind of bring up is, um, well, it's called antlers don't lie. And, and, and the, the idea is, you know, some of us stretch the truth a little bit where maybe we pretend to be a little more interested in the, um, you know, in the activities or hobbies of, of a potential love interest. Um, but we only have to look to other animals to conclude that this is not the best approach. You don't see hawks with fake claw extensions and you definitely don't see elk with hollow antlers. If a male tried to get away with hollow antlers, there would only be two possible outcomes for that particular male. Either A, he would get into a fight with a male that had real antlers and he might die, or he would, his bluff would be called and he would run away and not fight. Either way, the male with fake antlers wouldn't get the girl. And the reason for this is that female elk will watch uh, these displays of the males. And in elk and in many other species, in fact, when we're looking at traits that are being displayed to a potential love interest, we call them honest signals. So there's a relationship between performance and quality. There's no uh, tanning or, or, or spray salon for cardinal males to get redder. They are as red as they are. And that means that there's checks and balances in other animals uh, that really makes a good relationship between what you see is what you get. And, and so, of course, some individuals try to pretend they have more to offer than they really do, uh, but usually because of the first principle of being really choosy, this doesn't work. Now, there is an exception, and so I want to, full disclosure, if you're a long-tailed dance fly female, some of them do lie. And the way that they lie is really interesting. They like to get gifts from males, who doesn't? And males are really picky about who they give a gift to. In this case, it's like dinner. They give them a really big meal. And they like to give the meal to big females because larger females lay more eggs. Some female dance flies try to cheat by gulping air to make their abdomen swell up to fool the male into giving them their meal. 
This only works about 30% of the time, but it does work sometimes. In general though, lying about what you have to offer isn't a winning strategy. Now the last thing I just wanna share with you that's critical um, is because it determines what comes next after the love affair, you know, in the love affair of other animals, um, including humans. So there's all kinds of relationships out there and you need to have a clear idea of what kind of relationship you're interested in. Are you only interested in the squirrely kind of instant hookup? Maybe you wanna hang out for a few months, but you don't wanna make it permanent like the serial monogamist American lobster. Or maybe you do wanna find your forever mate like a barnacle goose who incidentally also taught me never to break up with someone and then go back and date them again. They don't do that. Once they break up, they're done. The reason this matters so much is that the information you use to pick a mate has a lot to do with what kind of relationship that you want to have. And so not misrepresenting what you want is pretty helpful. Now, this goes back to the honesty thing. And there's nothing wrong with being a squirrel or a lobster as long as you aren't pretending that you're a barnacle goose. Um, and so finding and choosing a good mate is not easy. In fact, it's a pretty big hurdle to overcome. Now, all the movies, uh, um, all the movies kind of end here with where you found your, you know, forever mate. But really, this is just the beginning. It takes a lot of effort to keep a relationship together and humming smoothly. And to tell you all about that, I want to pass things off to Zoe Donaldson. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so as I was putting together my talk, I thought, you know, what is an overly honest title? And what I came up with is today I'm going to talk to you about are humans actually monogamous and other questions I won't really answer. And the reason I'm not going to answer the question of whether or not humans are monogamous is because it turns out to be really, really complicated. So simply by looking across history, looking across cultures, we know that we are capable of an incredible variety of mating systems, right? So we have one man with multiple wives. Sometimes in some cultures, you actually find the opposite, one woman married to multiple men, and then what we would consider normative in most of today's age, which is a man and a woman who raise their offspring together. Now, all of these relationships have one thing in common, and that's that ultimately they're held together by long-term bonds. And our ability to form these bonds and our ability to fall in love is not something we have to learn to do. It is something that we are innately capable of at a biological level. And so as a neuroscientist, I'm really interested in the question of what is the biological glue that cements our bonds over time? And certainly it makes sense to look at this in humans. We have the capacity for language, and this means that we can ask, how much do you love your partner? How much do you miss them when they're away from you? But where humans sort of fall short is that they're not really a good species if you want to peer directly into the brain and ask, what happens at the level of individual cells and circuits when you fall in love? And so what this means is that my laboratory actually needs to take advantage of another species that can serve as a proxy that has much of the same behavioral tendencies that we exhibit when we fall in love. Now, from a scientific standpoint, we don't call it falling in love. We call it pair bonding. And it turns out that these guys are actually really, really good at pair bonding. These are monogamous prairie voles. They're found within the prairie states of the U.S. Um, and when in the, in the wild, when they meet, a male and a female will mate. They'll go off and establish a burrow. They'll have um, offspring and subsequent litters will be sired by the same dad. This is in striking contrast to sort of 90 percent of mammalian species species where the mom will mate and leave and take care of the offspring on her own. Now, as you can imagine, it's February and prairie voles are very popular at this time of year, so much so that they've actually inspired quite a bit of, of popular press, such as this article in Time, um, that tells you all about the science of romance and the chemistry of love, and they've even inspired a self-help book. So this book is Make Love Like a Prairie Vole, Six Steps to Passionate, Plentiful, and Monogamous Sex presumably in an underground burrow. 
Now, I'm not endorsing any of these in particular, but I do think that it highlights sort of how intensely we are interested in this topic of love. And that immediately brings to mind, how do you take something complex like love or pair bonding or monogamy and turn it into something that we can actually study and quantify within a laboratory setting? So uh, in order to achieve this, my lab actually takes advantage of a test that's been used for decades, and it's the equivalent of the dating test. We simply ask an animal the equivalent of, if you go to a bar with your partner, do you spend more time with them or with somebody that you don't know? And so the way this looks in the laboratory is that we can actually take our prairie voles and we can take a test animal who's in the center chamber here and it can explore the entire chamber and the two animals on the ends are actually tethered. So the test animal goes over and it investigates this novel opposite sex individual actually gets into a little bit of an argument. And this is because prairie voles when they form a bond they only want to be with their partner. And so here you can see the same animal finds their partner on the other side of the apparatus and they engage in this behavior that we call huddling. Now I will say that huddling looks an awful lot like cuddling, but we don't call it that because we don't want to over anthropomorphize. And so we can simply ask, who do you want to spend your time with? And what we'll see in this example data here is that an animal that's formed a bond will prefer to spend more time with its partner than the stranger. But a prairie vole that hasn't formed a bond, or if you did this in a traditional laboratory mice and rats, what you would see is that they don't distinguish between the two choices that they have. So one question I had is just what happens in the brain when you form a pair bond like this? And this is where prairie voles really shine because they allow us to go ahead and look directly into the brain. And I'm not exaggerating. We can take teeny tiny microscopes, place them on the head of a prairie vole and look into the brain. And when we do this, it looks like this. So the video on your, sh on your screen is showing you what look like spider webs. Those are the blood vessels within the brain. And then you see these occasional flashes of light. What we've done is we've genetically modified the prairie vole neurons such that when they're active, they glow. So we can watch a prairie vole running around and see exactly what's going on in its brain. Now, when we decided to ask this question of what happens in the brain when you form a pair bond, we were also particularly interested not just in forming a bond, but what happens when that bond matures over time. And I think this is something that we're all familiar with if you've ever fallen in love. The initial hedonic stages of falling in love tend to be quite different than those sort of longer term commitment associated and rewarding aspects of a relationship. And so we decided to look for one particular signature of this in the brain. And that's that we asked whether or not we could find cells whose neural activity predicted when an animal is going to run towards their partner. So in this goofy little diagram here, what that looks like is that a neuron has one of those flashes of light and then the test animal goes closer to their partner. So we were able to identify these cells. We call them approach cells. And then we just simply asked the question, how many approach cells are there? And what we found is that in animals, at the, at, before they had mated, which is naive at this time point, that they have basically the same number of cells that predict approaching to two animals they don't know, but that after they form a bond, what you see is more cells that predict partner approach. And this gets even more striking in long-term relationships. And this very nicely matches what we see with respect for, to behavior. So prairie voles, just like humans, gain in pair bond strength over time. And so that's exactly what you see here, that they start preferring their partner even more as these bonds mature. Now, this was really intriguing, but we thought to ourselves, well, this is nice collapsing all the data, but you know, not all prairie vole relationships, just like humans, are the same. And so it turns out that our prairie voles display a huge range of preference, sort of this proxy for bond strength. And what we were able to do is take advantage of that. And so on the y-axis, what I'm showing you is bond strength. And what we found is that this bond strength actually correlates really nicely with the expansion of this cell population that predicts partner approach. And so we started thinking, maybe what these cells are doing is they're encoding the desire to reunite with a partner. Because if you don't approach your partner, you're never going to reunite with them. And so we stepped back for a minute and we thought, how can we actually answer that question? And the reason that we weren't able to answer it with the data that we had already acquired is that it turns out that the test that we were using isn't really very good for measuring motivation or desire. So if you think back to the social choice test that I introduced you to, in order to have a perfect bond score, all an animal has to do is walk over to their partner, plop down, and spend the entire test period with them. Now, 
this is akin to if you hand me a box of Cheez-Its, I'll probably eat the whole box of Cheez-Its because I have a particular weakness for them. But that doesn't actually answer the question of how hard I'm willing to work or how much I desire those Cheez-Its. And so in order to get specifically at the neural basis of this desire to be with a partner, we've took advantage of something else that behavioral neuroscientists have been using for decades. And we said, let's make them work for it. And so we developed a task where prairie voles have to press a lever and in reward, they get to go spend 90 seconds with their partner. And so this is some hot off the presses data that I'm gonna show you here. Um, but what you'll see is on the far side of this video, a light comes on and then a, a lever comes out and the bull does this adorable whole body press and this opens a door and allows them to reunite with their partner. Now this is super cool because once the animals have made that association and they know that pressing a lever will get them access to their partner, we can start changing the rules of the game in order to make it a little bit more interesting. And one of the ways that we can change these rules is that we can simply say on every single trial, you get to choose one lever and one lever will deliver you access to your partner and the other lever will deliver you access to a novel. And so that's what this shows you. Here in the video, you see some circles pop up. This is showing you where the levers are. And after this little staring contest that seems to happen with the novel animal, what we see is that the test animal makes the decision. They're gonna, they wanna be with their partner. They go over, they very quickly, check the lever, and then he's he wants to be with the partner so much he's already trying to push the door open, even though we've put a little delay in there for experimental reasons. So we now have a way to specifically measure the motivation to be with a partner as opposed to just some opposite sex fold that they've never met before. And sort of reflecting this, what we find is when we give them this choice task, they reliably choose the lever that gives them access to their partner if they formed a pair bond. And furthermore, how much they prefer to press the partner level lever is reflected in their bond strength. So the idea is that we want to put all of this together to eventually ask whether or not these approach cells that we've identified are also active when the voles are working to gain access to their partner. Because that would suggest that what these cells are doing is actually acting as the physical substrate in your brain that is telling you that you want to be with your partner and motivating you to be with them. And that motivation is incredibly real. Think of the lengths that people will go to to maintain relationships over long distances. So I'm a teacher, and that means I always have take-home points at the end of my talks. And so the take-home points for you today are that the desire for reuniting with your partner is ultimately sort of the glue that keeps our relationships going. And we think that there's a particular set of cells in your brain that are encoding this motivation. And we can tap into that by identifying the cells that are active and predict when an animal wants to approach their pair bonded partner. But ultimately, we're not quite done, and that's the second half of my title. Other questions I won't actually answer today. If you invite me back in a year, I hope to have an answer to you as whether or not these approach cells are actually encoding the desire to be reunited. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention today. Wish you a very happy Valentine's Day. Um, and we've heard a little bit about why and how you choose a mate, and now how you stay together over time. And our last speaker, Dr. Hope Klug, is gonna tell us a little bit about why you might want to stay in that relationship. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Zoe, and thanks to everyone um, for your attention. Um, I'm Hope Klug, and today I'm going to be expanding on those fascinating presentations on mate choice, and I'm going to discuss what happens after individuals choose to mate. Um, I just want to note, unlike Jennifer, I'm not going to be drawing on my personal experiences, and this will make sense when you see some of the topics that I'm talking about at the end of this presentation. Um, so, mate choice itself is really amazing, um, as we saw earlier, and as we can see with this female bird of paradise that is examining the feathers and display behavior of this potential mate here. Once a mate is chosen, though, a lot of other very interesting things can happen. So when we think about mate choice, uh, we often think that mate choice is done once the physical act of mating takes place. And um, this is indeed what scientists thought for many, many years. Uh, we now know, however, that um, even after mating itself takes place, there is still more subtle mate choice and competition that occurs with respect to fertilization. And to put it shortly, sperm compete. 
Um, so in many animals, including humans, multiple mating and promiscuity, which is when both sexes mate with multiple partners, is relatively common. Um, if a female has mated with multiple males, mate competition typically continues after that physical act of mating. And this competition among male gametes has led to a range of evolutionary adaptations with sperm. Um, for example, um, so we're looking at the wood mouse right here. Um, the wood mouse, as you can see, it's a uh, very cute, this uh, very adorable animal, not as cute um, as the voles that we just saw, but, but still pretty cute. Um, the wood mouse uh, has a promiscuous mating system, and uh, because of the natural selection that has resulted from this promiscuous mating system, uh, sperm in, male wood, in the wood, male wood mouse uh, has adapted over many, many, many generations and many, many years. Uh, wood mouse sperm is particularly interesting because individual sperm cells have been found to cooperate in their race to fertilize a female's egg. Um, specifically, what happens in this species is that a couple of minutes after ejaculation, uh, the sperm of individual males will link up uh, using this specially adapted hook that's found on their, the head of the sperm, which you can maybe kind of see in this um, picture on the right side here. And uh, so they'll, they'll hook up, and then what happens is these groups of linked sperm, uh, which we can think of kind of as like sperm trains or packs of sperm, um, they link up and then they move towards the egg. And being linked up like this, it helps the sperm move towards the egg faster than individual sperm would be able to do on their own. Um, these fast swimming sperm uh, packs then give their genes the best possible chance of reaching that egg and fertilizing that egg. Uh, and in a particularly interesting study that was done by two researchers, uh, Fisher and Hoekstra, um, they found that the sperm from brothers who have mated with the same female are more likely to pair up than sperm from unrelated males. Um, and in a, in a sense, we can kind of think of this as brothers helping brothers. And uh, importantly, these brothers share some of their genes. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, because brothers share more genes with each other than they do with non-kin, this cooperation in relation to forming these fast-moving sperm trains is likely an adaptive strategy that makes individuals more likely to pass on their genes. Um, in addition to sperm competition, females are also choosy about the sperm that fertilizes their eggs. Um, so, for example, in some spiders, uh, in some spiders, studies have shown that females who mate with multiple males tend to store sperm and use more sperm for males who gave them a better nutritional gift at the time of mating. Uh, this is known as cryptic female choice because it's something that we can't usually see with regard to mate choice, um, but it is fairly common uh, in a range of female animals. Okay, so uh, we know that mating and mate choice can be complex and extend past the act of mating itself, um, but what happens once mating is actually complete? Uh, well, if mating was successful, we get babies. Uh, these babies uh, and animals, they can be eggs or they can be live offspring, uh, depending on whether a species lays eggs or gives live birth. Um, once mating happens and we actually have the babies present, this is when we get a true sense of how important mate choice actually was. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, sometimes the benefits of mate choice are related to um, good genes and uh, these uh, indirect benefits that um, individuals will get across generations. Um, so for example, choosing a good mate might allow your kids to be more fit or healthy or maybe themselves be a more, more attractive in mate choice in the future which in turn might better allow them to pass on their genes to future generations. Um, in addition, uh, in many species, the benefits of mate choice are more immediate and come in the form of parental care. Um, the evolution of parental care is closely linked with the evolution of mating strategies. And in animals, we see truly amazing diversity in parental care. Um, so we see everything from protection from predators, which is what we see in this primate that's guarding their baby um, over on the left side here. And also what we see in this giant water bug. Uh, this is a dad that's carrying his eggs around to try and um, protect them from predators and provide them with um, oxygenation. Um, so we see everything from protection from predators to male pregnancy, which is what we see in the, the seahorse. 
uh, to thermoregulation of young, which is uh, one of the things that we see in this penguin. Um, we also very commonly see feeding of young by parents, uh, which is what's going on with the, uh, the bird and the amphibian on the right side here. Um, and this, this blue creature uh, is particularly interesting. So uh, it's an amphibian, and uh, this is a mother that we see here with her babies. And uh, what she's doing is she's providing parental care to these young by actually allowing these offspring to eat her skin. Um, one thing that we've learned in recent years, uh, both from my own research and the research of others, is that the evolution of parental care is influenced by a range of factors. Uh, it's influenced by things like mating system, so that is how animals are grouped in relation to mating. Um, it's influenced by life history, so things like uh, maturation rate and uh, uh, survival during different um, life history stages. Um, it's influenced by ecology, so things like predation, resource competition. Um, and it's also very heavily influenced by offspring need and mate choice. Um, indeed, the evolution of parental care is heavily influenced by mate choice and mating dynamics in general. And parental care often co-evolves with behaviors that are associated with mating. Um, one interesting and really perplexing behavior that parental care often co-evolves with, which is a behavior that I study, uh, is filial cannibalism. Um, filial cannibalism is when a parent eats its own offspring and from an evolutionary perspective, it's really hard to imagine how something like eating your own babies could evolve and be maintained. Um, so if you're always eating your offspring, you're eating those genes, and so it's hard to see how those genes could uh, persist in a population. Um, for a long time, filial cannibalism was thought to just be this weird, rare, maladaptive behavior that only happened in very unnatural circumstances. Um, now, though, it's been uh, widely documented in a range of animals um, in natural circumstances. And because we now know that it occurs in a lot of animals in nature, it's thought to represent some sort of adaptive strategy. Uh, filial cannibalism, it occurs in a range of animals. So it occurs in spiders, insects, birds, mammals. Um, but it's particularly common and particularly well studied in fish species. Um, so for example, um, this is a small fish that I study uh, that lives in the, the Baltic Sea that's known as the sand goby. And um, sand goby males are the ones that provide all of the care for their eggs. Um, so what happens is females, they just mate and they take off and then they leave that dad with the eggs. Um, in general, these sand goby dads are really good fathers. So they'll build these nests uh, with sand around their shells, which is what we're seeing in the bottom picture here. Um, they fan their eggs to oxygenate them, they clean them, and they expend a lot of energy and time guarding them from predators. Um, sometimes though, they also eat their eggs and they actually tend to eat a lot of their own eggs. Um, and so, you know, why are these males eating their own young? Um, well, most of us would guess they're probably eating their own young because they're hungry. They're, they're providing parental care, it's really costly. Maybe they just need some extra food. Um, that's actually not what we think is going on uh, for the most part in this system. Uh, a study that we conducted a few years ago actually suggests that in some cases, these dads eat their eggs so that they can be done with caring for young and get back into the mating pool. Um, and so what happens if the eggs are taking kind of a long time to hatch, these dads will just eat them, clean out their nests, and then start trying to attract new females again. Um, and so in this system, it's really important for females to um, choose a good dad. Um, similarly, in a range of animals, including the primates and lion that we see here, um, we'll see infanticide in which males will kill offspring that have been fathered by another male. And um, this infanticide will then obviously end the care that that female's providing for her young and allow those females to be receptive to mating again. And so um, what I'm hoping you'll take away from this um, short uh, presentation on the consequences of mate choice and mating is that mating strategies, um, as we've seen, are incredibly diverse across animals. Um, so we see amazing patterns of mate choice, uh, huge variation in mating systems, and lots of different forms of mate competition in nature. And uh, these complex mating dynamics then have cascading evolutionary effects that lead to adaptations in a range of behaviors and physiology or uh, physiological traits.
Thank you. Hey, here. So if you have questions, uh, if you have questions, please throw them up uh, now. And if uh, all three speakers could join me, that'd be amazing. Jennifer, Zoe, and Hope. Um, I'm gonna leave this off. Um, the, one of the first questions was from Linda and she asked about examples of same sex relationships in nature. Uh, do any of you want to speak to that? I'd love to. Um, it's incredibly common. So in pretty much every group um, of, of sort of organism from insects to birds to mammals, you've got this diversity and this pairing up that can include same sex uh, for life or switch sometime in between. And the motivation for same sex uh, or sort of homosexual behavior it can be very different depending on the group. So a lot of beetles, it's kind of by accident, the males just like leap on the first thing that they encounter and it might be like, whoops, wrong thing. And others might be more long-term partnerships. It could be due to a lack of the opposite sex. So in lazy and albatrosses in particular, we know that females will pair up with other females because there's not enough males in the population. And the females solve the problem since they only have one chick at a time uh, of, of alternating who gets to have the chick. Uh, but yeah, it's it's all out there. The the rainbow of of relationships and experiences is reflected back in all the other species. Okay, um, so Gary asks basically, what's the deal with symmetry? Why do we like symmetry? Um, well, it's usually tied to physical health and genetic health. Uh, so imagine an owl wanting to catch a mouse and the mouse runs a tad bit crooked because it's not um, you know, perfectly symmetrical. Also, um, there can be perturbations or disturbances during development that alter the, the symmetry uh, that and it can be at, at all kinds of different levels. In humans, we know that there is a relationship between um, these kinds of traits and genetic health, fertility. Um, you, you know, so it's not that you have to be perfectly symmetrical, but we are attuned to how asymmetrical um, things are, and they tell us uh, things about age and health. Um, Zoe, uh, Michael asked, are there gender differences in vol bonding? Do, uh, and do they offer any insights into gender differences for humans? <laughs> um, so, so that's a loaded question on the sex differences from humans. So I will just say that like, if you just do look at the numbers, uh, there are not actually differences in things like whether women cheat more than men. Uh, in the past, there probably were some differences in the surveys uh, for a variety of reasons we can get into. Um, but I will get to the core of your question, which is sort of like, how do biological differences actually play out in this scenario? So one of the things that's really cool about voles is that males and females wind up in a pair bond, but they get there in slightly different ways. Um, and so we know this because the hormones that are involved are a little bit different for males and for females. Um, so while both males and females use a hormone called oxytocin, vasopressin is pretty much the exclusive purview of males. Um, and this is for a very simple reason. Males make more vasopressin in their brain than females do because it's testosterone responsive. Um, so what this means is, from my perspective, I find it super intriguing because sometimes we're not using sex differences to create more differences. We're using sex differences to achieve the same endpoint. Um, now, what does this mean for humans? So in humans, we think that there's also biased expression of vasopressin in the brains of males compared to females. But I would also add that we have like a much less developed understanding of exactly what these hormones are doing in humans, in part because our social behavior is so much more complex than that. Out of a bowl. Uh, Hope, I think this one's uh, for you. Melanie asks, why do some bugs eat their partners after sex? Ah, that's a great question. Um, because they can. <laughs> <It's a short laughs> answer. <laughs> um, so one reason that the, they will do this is um, to gain nutrients. And very often those nutrients are used to um, 
are used to care for offspring that they have. This is something that we see a lot in uh, spiders, for example, uh, where the male himself is this like nutritional gift to the female and then she gains this energy and then she can uh, care for offspring. There is, um, with respect to that, there is a lot of um, conflict between males and females in those systems because uh, it's obviously not in the male's best interest in a lot of cases to be eaten. And so um, in, in some cases, there are sort of counter adaptations to uh, that female behavior in which males will, will try to escape without being consumed. <laughs> okay, uh, we've had a couple different versions that basically uh, ask the question, has your research, I think this is all three of you might be able to weigh in on this, uh, has your research in, impacted the way you think about your own relationships and romance uh, at all? Well, so, I mean, very clearly I stated that it has. Um, I, I, you know, it's fundamentally changed the way I approach all relationships, you know, thinking about how other animals navigate conflict, communication, cooperation, um, sex, all of it, um, you know, even leadership or, you know, all of, all of those things when it comes to romantic relationships you know, I've had a lot more fun now because, you know, I mean, COVID independent, you know, dating sort of sitting across going, okay, which flag I see yellow flags. Now I don't pay attention to red ones. I'm not around long enough to get the red one. I, as soon as I see a yellow one, I'm like, Oh, yep. Nope. Got to go. Okay. And so it's, it's helped me escape sort of poor mate choice much faster and had me um, be more curious about the other person because I'm less concerned about rejection. I'm less concerned about, um, you know, kind of that, that the, the, the cultural, you know, kind of narrative that we have around romantic relationships. Um, so, so that's how it's changed for me. Yeah, and I would say for me, um, just having this broader perspective on the evolution of mating and mate choice it just kind of puts your own relationships um, in perspective a little bit. Um, and I did see in, in the Q&A, uh, one person asked if uh, this type of research takes the romance out of love. And I would say no, but um, I do find myself like sometimes using more technical terms, like just in daily conversation, like, you know, copulation isn't a term that like everyone's <laughs> using, but as a scientist you use it all the time. And so sometimes uh, terms like that just come up. <laughs> I would say um, I'm in the barnacle goose category with my husband. And so, you know, sometimes people are a little bit like, oh, but if you know how all this is happening biologically, doesn't it take the magic away? And I would say it doesn't take the magic away because what scientists have been striving for for so, so long is what is it that makes humans special? And that sort of boils down to like how big our brains are. And I think we can make a really solid argument that our brains are really big because our social behavior is so complex. And one facet of that is these incredibly long lasting pair bonds that we're capable of forming. And so I see it more as an homage to human evolution. Um, but I agree with Hope sometimes, you know, we turn to each other and say things like, how are your oxytocin levels? Can we do anything about that? Yeah, or, or demand a 20 second hug so you can get those oxytocin uh, hormones flowing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, Zoe, uh, Kara asked, what happens when voles break up? That's a really good question. Um, we already took a dark turn today. So I can say that, that we usually engineer these breakups by physically separating pairs. Um, and when we do so, they exhibit a lot of the same traits as you would see in humans that are grieving. So you see this sort of elevated stress responsivity, um, more behavioral distress, um, but they get over it. And that's what we're really interested in is sort of like, what does it take to get over this? And I think one of the ways that we can detect when they've gotten over, if you will, the loss of their partner adapted to the loss is when they're capable of forming a new bond with a new partner. Now, if you're a vole, that only takes about four weeks, but I think it essentially speaks to something about rebounding, if you will. <laughs> All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, can you, I, I know you, you sort of touched on this in a variety of ways, but, uh, would, would any of you feel comfortable with this question? What, what are the specific advantages of monogamy versus non-monogamy for species uh, generally? One of the advantages is that the pair bonding that comes with monogamy um, tends to uh, facilitate the evolution of parental care by both parents. 
Um, so if you have truly monogamous uh, systems or at least relatively monogamous systems, um, both parents can be pretty confident that the babies that they have are theirs. And then providing parental care from an evolutionary perspective makes a lot of sense, particularly if those offspring need care. Um, in contrast to that, um, if you have a promiscuous mating system um, where everyone's just kind of mating with everyone else, uh, for males in particular, it's not always um, clear, you know, that the offspring of a given female belong to them. And so um, it's less likely, you're less likely to get the um, evolution of bi-parental care. There are other advantages to monogamy as well that are a little bit species specific. So sometimes you're in a situation where the population is so sparse that you're better off sticking with one mate and uh, hoping for successive mating opportunities than leaving them to try to find a different mate. Um, there's also, so in humans, this is pretty human specific, but we have really, really weird babies in the sense that our babies are born really premature and they take a really long time um, to grow to independence. And so it's not uncommon at all for a woman to give birth to multiple babies that cannot independently take care of themselves. And so what that means is that we need these long-term bonds to take care of our babies. So this all goes back to how big your brain is. Um, and I will just point out that monogamy is one way to achieve that. It's not the only way because you can also have relationships like grandmothers who stick around well past menopause um, that can help you to raise your offspring. And I would also like to just add that you can have social, what we call social monogamy, where you have a pair bond that is cooperating and working together, but you don't have genetic monogamy. So um, there are various reasons for that. So in, in um, uh, certain primates like TT monkeys or even um, Ethiopian wolves, if the female is too closely related to the male partner, she may seek out another male um, to uh, father the offspring, but still stay in the pair bond with the male that she's with. And usually males that detect infidelity by the female and their pair bond don't usually want to, sometimes they'll terminate the pair bond. So this is common in birds. Um, if they find the female has cheated, they leave the nest. So Zoe, Jennifer, and Hope, we have over 45 more questions, uh, but that's all we have time for today. And thank you so much. This was fascinating. Uh, I'm going to invite Ann to come back in with us. Here we are. There's Ann. Um, you guys, that was incredible. It was great. And that's what I said at the top of this. Three amazing women, three amazing scientists, and we thank all of you because that was really great. And, uh, and of course, we will be back next week. In November 1st, 2019, the National Academy of Sciences was host to TED at NES, the first all science lineup for the TED conference. And it was an actual TED conference. It wasn't a, uh, a TEDx. And so we are very fortunate. We will have three of those presenters back with the science curator, Ted B uh, David Biello from TED, who will be the moderator of that. And we're going to talk with three of those presenters, get an update date on their science and then talk a little bit about what that experience was like to be part of the first all science lineup and so please join us next week Sachi will get an invitation in your inbox so that you can learn more about those presenters and we'll be back and we hope you will be too yeah so I had a few of you text me also we're not doing a VIP video Q&A for this event um, if you want those let us know like yeah. just like put it on the Q&A or send us an email because we are interested in if you want them more, if you want them less, if you think we're getting a balance there. So yeah. thanks everybody for tuning in today and would love your feedback. Bye.